Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Laura Cecci Galanos. I am the executive manager of the World Stroke Academy, the education platform of the World Stroke Organization that provides stroke education to health professionals worldwide. Now, it is with great pleasure that I am hosting this educational activity today on the updates in the neurological approach to post-cardiac arrest prognosis with exceptional speakers who will be sharing their expertise on the topic. As per usual, before introducing today's moderator, today's speakers, we'll have a quick look at some of our housekeeping rules. We, of course, welcome any questions that you might have throughout the webinar, but we kindly ask you to use the Q&A box for those in your Zoom control panel. We have prepared some poll questions that we invite you to participate in. You can, of course, use the chat box to say hi or leave any comments you might have. Uh, a reminder that this webinar is recorded and the recording link will be uploaded on the World Stroke Academy webinar page. And lastly, we kindly invite you to fill in the evaluation survey at the end to share your feedback with us. Now, without further ado, let me introduce today's moderator, Dr. Claire Krautsfeld, board certified neurologist at Harborview Medical Center, Seattle, and associate professor of the Department of Neurology, University of Washington. Welcome, Dr. Claire, and thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we're all really excited. We have a wonderful group of experts in this field lined up, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Roma Geocaden, who's uh, professor of Neurology, Neurosurgery and Critical Care at Johns Hopkins, and he's going to talk about comatose survivors of cardiac arrest, timing of prognostication and decisions leading to the withdrawal of life-sustaining therapies. His talk will be followed by Dr. Carolina Marciel, who's an Assistant Professor of Neurology and Neurosurgery in Florida. She's a um, neurointensivist and critical care encephalographer and the director of research in the division of neurocritical care. She'll talk about deciphering the waves, the role of electrophysiologic tools in outcome prediction following cardiac arrest. And then she will be followed by Dr. Alejandro Rabinstein, who is professor of neurology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and he will talk about how can pictures help the value of neuroimaging for prognosis after cardiac arrest. Welcome, everyone. Romer, you're on. Do I start? Yes. Yeah. Oh, OK. Uh, should I just share my screen? Okay, one second. Good morning to everybody. Uh, as we were discussing prior to this, uh, pre in the, during the preparation, the speak, this is such a worldwide uh, representation of people in the panel, and we're so happy that it is. So my talk today is to focusing really on the timing of prognostications and the decisions leading to withdrawal of life-sustaining therapies. Um, let me start by asking everybody a question. Here, in comatose survivors of cardiac arrest, what percentage of patients with favorable outcome wake up after seven days of arrest? A, three to 5%, B, eight to 10%, C, 18 to 20%, and D, 24 to 26%. Let's see. So of all people that have good outcome, how many of them actually wake up after seven days? Let's see. Uh, and uh, the, the answer, uh, the question is provided for there. You could submit it and let's see how we do. Uh, Laura, let me know if I go, go on to the slides and the talk. Here are the results. Oh, here's the results. Oh, wow. That's an interesting spread. Uh, the correct answer is wait until my lecture is done. Uh, okay. So, but I'll, I'll actually uh, go to it later in my lecture. So that, that's actually really the hook here. Okay. So, uh, 
So here are my disclosures. Uh, my biggest disclosure right now, I'm PI of the ISCAP trial, which is probably the largest therapeutic hypothermia trial in the United States, 60 centers. Uh, and I've been with AHA and AAN for guidelines for cardiac arrest. So many of the things that I'm saying here are probably related to the things that I do academically, as well as in the organizations and also of the science. I have multiple grants in this area. So let me start by this, what we have learned. So when I was a fellow of Dan Hanley here at Hopkins, he told me, Romer, you should go to neuroprognostication. And I really told him, Dan, there's nothing there or they, we already know what will not work. And then I realized that that was 1996. Since then, what I have learned is with neuroprognostication, we can actually harm patients. This is probably the reason why many of the clinical trials fail. And this is also probably the reason why we still do not understand what is happening with the injury and the therapies that we have. And I will explain to you why. So, because this is a neurocentric group, uh, we have to start with the cardiac arrest as the biggest ischemic stroke there is, right? Everybody talks about an MCA stroke, but an MCA stroke is just a small fragment of the brain. Cardiac arrest actually is ischemia to the whole body, but the pattern of injury is selective vulnerability with the focus being the CA1 and the neocortex, practically the cortex, the cognition, and relatively uh, vulnerable are the thalamus and at, on the brainstem such that you could actually lose the entire cortex and have the brainstem intact, which is really a setup for a vegetative state or a uh, wakeful unresponsive state, or you unresponsive wakeful state, UWS. And in this here is actually, let me uh, go to my pointer here, is a representation that Will Longstreth did, uh, where uh, Claire is right now at University of Washington in Seattle which actually looks at the differential susceptibility of the brain, such that for a given similar amount of injury, the cortex is already gone, but the brain stem is involved, which gives you this UWS state. And then uh, at some point in uh, 2011, I was in the panel in the AHA, and we said, what are, the, what are the important prognostic parameters that we need to do after when we do clinical trials in cardiac arrest? And one of the things that we have identified really is the ability of the patient to wake up and have comprehensible speech and follow commands seems to be the inflection point in the recovery, whether that's per resuscitation, early course, discharge, or post-discharge. So it is really the recovery from coma, and that is the most important thing. And so this is actually a slide which takes us from 1986 to 2022. It's actually very disturbing because this is the brain resuscitation clinical trials run by Peter Safar one of the fathers of their modern resuscitation, were actually showed that the, uh, the survival is about 20%. And of those that survive, the vast majority are attributed to uh, systemic, but about a quarter to a third of the deaths are attributed to brain injury. But then fast forward 2022, so this is the Telstar study that just came out in the New England Journal. Look at the controls and the treatment arm. The mortality is still 80% to 82%. That's really not different, right? From what it is. And of course the poor outcome is 90%, but here's the disturbing fact. Withdrawal of life support accounted for 70% of the deaths. And I will tell you that withdrawal of life support is not a natural way of dying. It is a bias that clinicians put and I'll give that in the rest of my slides. So as neurologists, we have to understand before we prognosticate, it's almost like stroke, right? We have to understand what's happening. So this is ischemic brain injury. And we can talk about this for an hour, but the key point really that we have to understand is just like any ischemia, the brain gets injured, it swells, and then it dies. Until we actually have proven that that part is irreversible, there is no point in prognosticating because we will be wrong. And the peak really is about five to seven days. So any prognostication, I don't, care what tool you have very early on that is existing before that is probably going to be not reliable. So we have to be very careful because this is where the science is. We have to look at this like an ischemic brain tissue. And with an ischemic brain tissue, we know that the peak swelling is about five to seven days. And so uh, I just want to give you a heads up on this. So Karen Hirsch and I just finished this, and this is right now under peer review and circulation. 
Because right now we talk about prognostication, we talk about CPR, but we don't really talk about how to manage these people in the ICU. So the NCS, Neurocritical Care Society, as well as the AHA formed a joint panel that Karen and I uh, uh, co-chaired. And this is actually uh, in, in peer review right now. So you'll probably see this in a few months. But, but here's the thing of my talk. So if we have a cardiac arrest itself, right? So there's like this no flow time, which is the direct no flow during resuscitation. And then when you do CPR time, that's a partial flow time, right? And when you have those injury, right now what we have is temperature management. So the depth of temperature, the time to target and the duration of temperature. But the important part is the time to heal. Are we giving the body enough time to heal with the treatments that we have? So right now we are in PI of the trial ice cap, which is looking at the duration of temperature. Uh, I have no time to talk about this, but it's actually an interesting design. It's an adaptive trial design. Let's look at 6, 12, 24, 48, and 72 hours of 33 degrees. But the key point in my talk right now is the time to heal, which is prognostication. The problem here is the pattern of neuroprognostication that we have is clouded by the fact that it is focusing on poor outcomes only and the withdrawal of life support being the key is almost 100% leading towards death. And actually the other thing here associated with ISCAP, we have a sub-study called PrecisCAP that actually wants to change the way we think about neurological prognostication. And so I'm going to talk about this right now because everybody who is a neurologist here who were trained is probably familiar with this Levy paper. So we always wonder where did the one, three and seven days come from? This is it. This is the study that looks at what patients look like at day one, at day three, and then at day seven. And I gave grand rounds actually at Cornell in front of many of these people. Oh my God, that was one of the scariest grand rounds I ever had. But I still question there because actually there's a lot of flaws here. And you have to remember, right? This is 1985. They have different ventilators. They have different ICU care. They have different the way they care for post-cardiac arrest patient is almost 100% different then. So things have to change, but things did change. And actually there's a lot of issues with this paper that nobody talks about until fairly recently. And then one of my idols, Ilko Vedix, led this uh, paper for the American Neurology, uh, American Academy of Neurology that actually tried to frame how are we going to do neurological prognostication? The problem with this is none of these patients that Ilko did were actually treated with therapeutic hypothermia. So you have to remember that big caveat. But the one thing that Ilko did here, which is wonderful, is he focused on false positive rates. And he all graded those acceptable as with less than 1%. But the, there's a lot of problem here. And so therefore, right now, please do not use this because this is obsolete. Actually, there's a backstory here that I want to share. Ilko and I are under negotiation right now with the AAN to revise this. And hopefully they will give us the go ahead for 2022. So what do we know? So I was on this panel that, and, and this is the same thing at the AAN and many other guidelines. What is the differentiation between you know, uh, association and prediction? Association is when there's a p-value and some association, but prediction should be very strict. The false positive rate should be 1% and a narrow confidence interval. So what do we know from that? What we know is no pre-arrest factors are reliable to less than 1% with a narrow confidence interval. And no intra-arrest factor is also a reliable predictor of functional outcome. We know that very well because some people could arrest for five minutes or 20 minutes and still have widely very good outcomes for both patients. And that has been shown over and over again in the literature. And so what is the reliability now? It is really the post-arrest neurological exam that continues to be the reliable predictor of functional outcome. But the issue here is this, right? And I have to go faster here because I'll be running out of time. Uh, is, is, is brain death is not a natural death. Uh, and ra rather, uh, prediction is not a natural prediction. Uh, it is not a natural death. It is really an artificial death. So, and it is, so a lot of the things that we do right now is really studied with self-fulfilling prophecy. So when you look at a lot of the studies out there, look, if the time of death was preceded by withdrawal of life support, and because if it was, then it is self-fulfilling prophecy, do not trust those. So then the American Academy of Neuro, the American Heart Association uh, that I chaired championed this to look at 
all of the studies right now because everything was like coming back and forth. So we look at about 400 to 500 studies. And what we found was that the current evidence is really low. And so therefore we should not follow them, right? So what are the things that we did? So this is from the curing coma campaign. And what we hear, found here is that 90% of deaths occur in the first three days. And that is really disturbing because we know that the markers here, you know, when you look at the prediction studies, they are convenient samples. There's no blinding. Almost all of them are retrospective. There's a lot of self-fulfilling prophecy and there's a lot of external validation. And this is true for cardiac arrest, for TBI, ICH, subarachnoid hemorrhage, right? And so this is actually one of the things that is rather disturbing because this is a paper by Jonathan Elmer and Jonathan Elmer uh, did in the Rock Consortium look at about how 4,265 patients died and about one third of them died of withdrawal of life support within less than 72 hours. And what was the reason for that? And if they did that, so there's about like 2,300 patients previously resuscitated that died that shouldn't have died in the first place. So that is disturbing. And so the question really then becomes, is there a difference between early awakening versus late awakening? By early awakening, we mean less than three days or after three days or after seven days. And so there are several studies. So there's study 80%. So this is a study by Paul, uh, which is actually published out of the French registry, several thousand patients, where they found that 80% of the good outcome patients will recover within 3.5 days, but you still have the 20% here that you don't account for. And then Max Mulder, when he was a fellow here at Hopkins and Grosser's Truer, who was actually at, the, at Penn, found that delayed awakening with good outcomes can occur after seven days. And then all three here with TTM actually increased the good outcomes to 11% to 32% if you do TTM with the late awakeners. And then there is this interesting compelling paper that just came out recently, uh, 2022 and uh, in Critical Care Medicine by Tsai et al. So the interesting thing about this paper is that in Taiwan, they are not obligated to withdraw care because the system supports the patients. What they did here, they continued to observe patients for longer than seven days. And what they found was that up to 9.6% of favorable outcomes are greater are found on seven days and the average is about 12 days. So the answer to the question that I first showed is actually B, which is like eight to 10%. For those that are treated with TTM, about 12, the, the good outcome fraction after seven days go to 12% versus 7.6%. So it's interesting that what this actually means is that if we prognosticate early, and we withdraw life-sustaining therapies early on, we would end up killing up to 10% of these favorable outcome patients. That is rather disturbing. So this actually has filtered down to the clinical trials now, because when you think about this, right? If we do clinical trials and the outcomes are death and we prognosticate at 72 hours, we're not even seeing the effect of the drug in 72 hours. And so the trial will be flawed. And that's the problem. So Nielsen actually in the TTM1 said that no prognostication, uh, for all prognostication greater than 72 hours, for the ECMO CPR, all prognostication greater than 72 hours, and TTM2 uh, that just came out. Prognostication, blinded guided protocol for 96 hours, and then the ICAP study, which I'm one of the PI prognostication, at least 96 hours. And so here's the recommended wait time. So it's not three days because we already know it's flawed. It's not five days because it's not flawed. Maybe it's seven days. That is the AHA statement that we did in that uh, standards. If you can wait for 10 days, if I am the patient, please wait until 14 days. Remember 14 days is not forever. We give patients and our science a chance because if we cut this abruptly, then that's it. So we actually wrote the editorial for that Tsai study uh, Sienna Duarte and I, and this is what we wrote. The dilemma exists uh, determining that a patient has a high chance of unfavorable outcome and subsequent WST is deemed ethical to limit 
unwarranted suffering. So that's, that, that's all we think. If there's no hope, why do we prolong it? However, there is a larger ethical problem if flawed neurological prognostication and adequate observation leading to misclassification of patients who otherwise would have a favorable outcome but are subjected to withdrawal of life support. So we are act, if we make a mistake, the consequence of that is the patient will die. And so this is the ISCAP trial. And right now we are actually undertaking also what we call the precise cap study. Jonathan Elmer and Karen Hurst is the lead PI. And what we're trying to do here is, and I know Carolina and uh, uh, Alejandro will talk about EEG and MRI, but we're taking a slightly different twist here. What we're doing here is we're looking for predictors of responsiveness rather than predictors of poor outcome. And this is my email, and I think I've exceeded my time here, so I apologize, uh, and I'll stop here. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Thank you so much, Roma. Uh, we will move on to Dr. Carolina Marcial, who will help us decipher the waves. So, Roma, if you stop sharing. There you go. Thank you. And then we'll have time for questions at the end of the three talks. Um, is the presentation projecting okay? Yes, all right, perfect. Uh, well, this is um, my uh, QR code for my contact. You can just uh, scan and it's gonna show up later on again uh, if you need to contact me uh, with any questions, updates. I am uh, the PI for a pilot clinical trial on um, a therapeutic um, management, a novel therapeutic management of post anoxic status epilepticus called VIGAPSTAT, funded by American Heart Association. That's my only disclosure. So we hope that by the end of this talk um, that you'll be able to acknowledge the factors contributing to the variability interpretation of EEG findings in the post-cardiac arrest period and what those findings mean uh, in relation to outcomes. Um, we'll then learn, uh, be able to identify what it is a highly malignant pattern, a malignant pattern, and benign EEG patterns in the post-cardiac arrest period. And um, also in a, another no, uh, neurophysiologic tool, we'll recognize the meaning of absent cortical latencies in the post-cardiac arrest period on SSCPs. So I love to say that um, the brain talks uh, and oftentimes in comatose patients or in severely, um, in, in severe acute brain injuries, it is sort of a whisper. And we need to learn how, um, how to identify what it is that the brain is saying. And EEG is one of those tools that can uh, give us a window to the brain in comatose patients. And it is really an invaluable tool in neuroprognostication and has actually been deemed cost-effective uh, by raising um, the specificity for poor outcome prediction uh, by um, Eddie Amorin, a brilliant um, neurointensivist and also cardiac arrest researcher. EEG can also help us identify phenomena that exacerbates mismatches on a bioenergetic supply and mm -hmm. demand, how much energy the brain is actually demanding from the body, uh, like in shivering uh, situations or seizures, right? And this is particularly helpful in the post-cardiac arrest period, so super useful. But to really take that to the full potential, we got to be able to speak the same language. Um, all right, a question for the group. Let's pull. Which of the following EEG uh, findings does not constitute a highly malignant pattern? And we are going to go over every uh, one of those. But um, unreactive EEG, birth suppression, suppressed background with continuous periodic discharges, or suppressed background without epileptiform discharges? All right, well, uh, similar trend with uh, Romer. So we have a, a very interesting spread. And what I wanna really 
um, bring it up attention is unreactive EEG does not constitute a highly malignant pattern. Um, and it's kind of a uh, provocative question because uh, reactivity on EEG is one of the most widely talked about feature or finding uh, and for its uh, value in predicting outcomes. But we are coming to understand um, that it is really not that reliable. All right. So what is this classification that came about? Highly malignant, malignant, benign. So essentially West Hall um, in 2014 uh, took, um, engaged in an undertaking of actually um, taking a look at all the EEGs uh, performed in TTM1 trial and uh, as a sub-study to um, identify the uh, prediction performance uh, of a specific findings. So it, it, uh, they, this group created this classification um, that includes highly malignant, malignant, or benign um, based on their hypothesized uh, false positive rates for poor outcome. So these features of suppressed background without discharges or suppressed background with continuous periodic discharges and birth suppression were classified in highly malignant um, a priori based on the hypothesis that will have a very, uh, uh, a very low false positive rate of 0%, uh, thus being a reliable tool. And as you can see here, what are um, the, the features for malignant? And it is important to understand that benign does not mean a favorable EEG pattern. It just means in this classification that it is the absence of highly malignant or malignant EEG. Now, this was in 2014. And then in 2015, they, um, they, they decided to, uh, to, to, to um, evaluate, okay, so, but even if we have this classification, are people using the same, uh, the same uh, methods or definitions to be able to actually, like, do we mean the same thing? Do we agree when we call something highly malignant, malignant, uh, or benign? And while uh, you have a, um, a substantial um, agreement with a kappa of 0.71 for highly malignant, it was quite concerning that um, the, the, the inter-rater agreement for reactivity was actually 0.26, uh, so definitely unacceptable. And even for malignant, 0.42 moderate, uh, but also unacceptable. And then, okay, fine, this is one, one year after the, the publication of, uh, of this classification. So how about for a different, and by the group that actually put it forth, which actually makes it even more concerning. So another group of investigators in 2021 um, took, uh, uh, took an endeavor of uh, seeing what will be the, what will be the agreement uh, by two senior consultants and one uh, trainee in clinical neurophysiology. And you can see here the kappa coefficient ranging from 0 0.29 uh, to 0 0.62. So we are not speaking the same language, uh, despite the fact that this being uh, one of the most widely used classifications uh, in modern times for um, EEG and outcome prediction post cardiac arrest. So let's see some examples of what those uh, patterns actually mean. So uh, we'll start with highly malignant. So suppressed background, essentially less than uh, 10 microvolts for all cerebral activity. This is an extreme example that act uh, a standard gain of seven microvolts per millimeter. You are not really seeing any detectable cerebral brainwave. And um, in, an, in a very well-conducted meta-analysis by, um, by Sandroni uh, published in 2020, you can see the false positive rates uh, for um, using a background suppression. And uh, it's um, fairly uh, good and consistent in being close to zero. But uh, to, uh, that important uh, point also is that not 100% reliable, right? You still have some studies with uh, incredibly high false positive rates, um, as you can see here, Lamartine and uh, it's Carpino and Benares. Um, in addition to um, uh, the important point that Romer made, um, it's not only the false positive rate, but also the confidence interval. And you can see that sometimes you have an unacceptably high and wide uh, confidence interval, and that needs to be taken into uh, consideration.
now suppressed background with discharges. So this is a suppressed background with uh, generalized periodic discharges. When the brain is actually performing like in a metronomic way, uh, akin to um, the consistency of the electrical activity of the heart, very bad, very bad brain injury in this example. And you can see even better performance in predicting a poor outcome um, across the studies. Uh, but again, some studies with a confidence interval that are a little bit too high or wide rather. And birth suppression, birth suppression means that a greater than 50% uh, um, suppression of activity, as you can see here, it's about 70% in this page. Um, and um, also an example of a, what it is considered highly malignant pattern. But it is interesting that fairly recently, about a year ago, um, a case series of about 10 patients um, identified the clinical correlate of these uh, relatively simple uh, bursts with tonic eyelid opening. And um, it is um, interesting that this was a transient phenomenon lasting for about uh, 30 hours, but important to educate the primary team and families that this is not the patient waking up. This is involuntary and uh, it is, uh, it may be considered a nictal phenomenon because it is in lockstep with those bursts. So birth suppression also performing fairly well as predicted with uh, nearly zero uh, false uh, positive rates, but again, not consistently across all studies. And even when used ACNS, American um, Clinical Neurophysiology Society definition for birth suppression, so very, um, very standardized uh, nomenclature for ICU EEG, you still have unacceptably high false positive rates. A different type of, uh, of birth suppression is when you have identical births, it reflects loss of variability on the electrical activity of the brain. And when for more than 90% of the births, you see the first uh, 500 milliseconds of each burst are similar across all channels as an example here on A. Or if you have an stereotyped uh, cluster of bursts, uh, again, the first 500 milliseconds of more than 50%, uh, of more than 90% of the bursts um, are uh, identical uh, across all channels. And this is how it looks like in real life EEG, as you can see um, here, the first 500 milliseconds. Um, going back to the brain talks, um, what I visualize when I see this is essentially, you know, like the brain is isolated. They, they, you have this pool of neurons that, as opposed to that normal chattering of neurons communicating with their surroundings and many projections, it is a rather, a rather simplistic conversation and an agonal cry for help. Um, so I, 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 when I read those EEGs, I, I literally visualize um, what, um, what the neurons are trying to talk. Um, I am nerdy. Another type of identical bursts is um, highly epileptiform identical bursts. And within the bursts, you see those repetitive um, discharges, repetitive spikes. Um, so how do they perform? Similarly, uh, as across all studies, very close to 0%, but with wide, uh, sometimes wide confidence intervals. But malignant pain. Um, they were right uh, in terms of uh, not being close to zero in, uh, in false positive rates, but substantially, uh, substantially uh, higher than actually 50 uh, than 5%. And you have uh, many different uh, findings. Um, the ones that I want to uh, bring attention to is um, reactivity. So here's an example that you uh, stimulate the patient over here, and you are not really seeing any, uh, any uh, changes on EEG. Now, look at reactivity, uh, lack of reactivity. You know, it's, it's really all over the place. And if you can take one thing from this lecture today is that uh, absent reactivity is not a reliable predictor of a poor outcome. And probably this is because reactivity, we came to understand that it's really a Pandora box. We all assess it differently in a subjective and non-standardized way. And while we are making progress in trying to standardize, and this is a consensus put forth in 2018 uh, by, uh, by Admiral and all, 
And you have all those rules, particularly in pandemic times, it is hard to actually pull the resources to do this consistently with EEG techs in short age, with, um, with a critical care nurse in short age. So we have to be uh, more, um, more lenient about, uh, about um, what does actually mean lack of reactivity. And uh, please do not interpret this as that there is absolutely no chance for outcome. But uh, for a good outcome, as we are talking about Pandora box, another thing is myoclonus post cardiac arrest, right? And if I say it is a Pandora box because the clinical significance varies across the studies, and we know that not all myoclonus is the same. Um, and the other challenge is that across all the studies, there are different nomenclatures. Going back to what we are talking about, we need to talk the same language. So it's used as status myoclonus post um, anoxia myoclonus post hypoxic myoclonus myoclonus post-cardiac arrest, Lenz-Adams syndrome. Um, and uh, it is important to understand that even when it is cortical myoclonus, meaning the discharge, the, 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 the uh, jerks are happening in lockstep with the EEG discharge, it's not all of them are the same. And when they are subcortical, they have a different meaning also. So not all myoclonus are the same and we are starting to understand, uh, starting to learn their nuances. So a key landmark paper to illustrate this point, uh, it's Elmer's paper in um, Annals of Neurology, with, uh, with you have two types of uh, post-anoxic myoclonus of cortical origin. You have those highly epileptic form bursts over here in lockstep, and 100% of those patients actually achieved a poor outcome. Again, some that are likely contaminated by self-fulfilling prophecy. But in contrast to this, type two, when you have low voltage, midline predominant, uh, repetitive discharges in a periodic pattern, um, and in a nearly continuous or in a continuous uh, background. So 50% of those patients actually were able to achieve a good outcome, which means independence in this patient population. All right, um, in the next couple of minutes, I want to just cover seizures, status epilepticus, and epileptic form abnormalities. Again, big, big box of hyperexcitable findings. Um, generalized periodic discharges have been shown to be associated with the hyperactivity of thalamocortical circuit. And it is important to think about this as timing is everything and uh, including in the prognostic significance. So we know that having epileptic form uh, findings early is actually associated with a poor outcome. So if you are gonna get epileptic form discharges in EEG, you can still have a, a good outcome, but it's better to actually have it later. So Barbella paper um, put forth a, a prediction score for who is gonna regain consciousness of those that actually develop a uh, epileptic form EEG and take into consideration the evolution of EEG overnight, uh, over time. Post-anoxic status epilepticus is an orphan entity, is the main exclusion of all therapeutic trials with the exception of one that was Telstar study just published uh, this month in New England Journal of Medicine. It does not reflect 100% uh, uh, risk for a poor outcome, but we do not know how to treat it yet. Um, so it can happen at any time post-cardiac arrest, it can last for several days. Um, and it is uh, rather a, another one of those Pandora box that we are starting to uh, learn about it. I'm going to skip radiographic correlate as uh, Alejandro is going to give a remarkable talk. Um, I just wanted to say very quickly that uh, even highly malignant uh, patterns have all variable associated with association with uh, where the lesion is uh, in the patterns of MRI and how bad can it be with even highly malignant patterns actually having no MRI lesions uh, at all. The um, somatosensory evoke potential. So this is essentially a test that we zap the medium nerve um, and then we look for the connectivity, the integrity of this pathway uh, traveling all the way to uh, the primary sensory cortex. And uh, we measure, sorry, we measure those cortical latencies or the peaks over time. This is just an example. And you wanna make sure, like we are pr primarily interested on in N20s, that is uh, what it is, uh, the, the, the response uh, at the primary cell, some of the cortex. 
but you want to make sure that the pathway is um, it's, uh, intact. Uh, so you want to see all those waveforms. And if you have bilateral absence and 20s um, in the setting of having present all the other uh, preceding waveforms, it is one of the most reliable uh, neuro electrophysiology uh, neuroprognostic tools. But again, even in that setting, we have some with unacceptably high false positive rates, likely because of technical challenges uh, and uh, subjectivity and interpretation. So in conclusion, um, neuroprognostic tools are just a piece of this complex puzzle and no findings are really infallible in predicting good or poor prognosis. So you need to stick to definitions, standardize as much as possible of the methods of evaluation and reporting, but take into consideration uh, neuroprognostication in a holistic uh, manner. Uh, not only characterizing injury burden, but individual values, what it is an acceptable deficit uh, in the future that that individual will find and how much this brain can take more or um, can actually dodge further insults. Um, in the slides that you have access to, you have a bunch of uh, references uh, that I'm sure you will enjoy reading. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Dr. Marcia, there's um, lots of exciting, these are lots of exciting updates, uh, quite amazing. And then there's also even some chatter going on in the Q&A. So um, next we have Dr. Rabinstein talking to us about pictures. Okay, so I'll talk about pictures and I'll try to be brief. So to leave some time for questions, uh, you have heard two great talks. Uh, a, on uh, a aspects of uh, cardiac arrest uh, prognostication that have more literature than uh, imaging. But uh, there are things that uh, we do know, uh, have no disclosures, uh, a, about uh, the role of uh, a brain imaging for neurological prognostication. And we have also learned that there are a number of caveats and uh, persistent knowledge gaps that need to be considered when imaging patients after cardiac arrest and trying to put that into the context of neuroprognostication. So here goes my question, which of the following is the best validated uh, radiological signs to prognosticate the neurological outcome after cardiac uh, arrest, loss of cortical gray-white uh, differentiation on head CT on day one, low ADC in cortex on uh, brain MRI day five, hyper intense flare imputamen on brain MRI day seven, or a high ADC in cortex on MRI day two. Okay, interesting. So Hopefully uh, you uh, are going to be able to uh, uh, learn uh, something from this uh, brief talk. Uh, and uh, so head CT, a, a lot of you chose uh, head CT uh, and uh, brain edema on head CT uh, is a, uh, a sign of uh, brain injury. It can be a sign of uh, poor prognosis when it is definitely there. The way it manifests is by loss of gray white matter differentiation and effacement of, uh, of the sulci when it is very severe. There is also effacement of the basal cisterns. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one of the problems in practice is that the head CT is usually obtained only very early after the cardiac arrest, sometimes even investigating the cause for the cardiac arrest, yet a brain edema is something that uh, gets worse over time, and yet the head CT is not repeat it later on, and therefore that limits uh, the sensitivity of head CT substantially. The other big problem with head CT is the limited interrate the reliability even uh, among uh, presumed uh, expert uh, readers. You can measure the Hounsfeld units, you can uh, do an automated assessment of the degree of hypodensity, but at the end of, uh, of the day, uh, uh, the interrate reliability is at best fair. 
Now, when we see a picture like this, we uh, can all agree that there is a global brain edema and this cannot be good. When it, uh, uh, the situation is extreme, you can even see a pseudo subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage from the uh, congestion of venous blood that can look like this. And this is definitely not good. Now, in general, uh, the uh, LECTs show pictures that are uh, less uh, overt, less clear than, than that. There have been some attempts at uh, qualitatively assessing uh, uh, the, the brain in a, in a form that can uh, be scored and uh, uh, extrapolating from the stroke uh, literature, there has been the proposition of using the aspect score on both sides of the brain to characterize the degree of uh, loss of gray white matter differentiation and sulcal effacement in patients with cardiac arrest. This has not uh, 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 catch on uh, uh, too much uh, uh, in a regular practice. In terms of uh, quantitative uh, uh, and uh, even automated assessment uh, uh, of uh, uh, brain edema on head CT, unfortunately, there is no standard uh, technique that is used across centers. Quantitative assessment of uh, manually selected uh, region, uh, regions of interest have uh, led to variable results automated assessment, uh, uh, such as this proposed uh, last year uh, in a publication in uh, critical care medicine of uh, comparing uh, the gray white matter uh, ratio of the putamen versus uh, internal capsule when that difference is less than 10%, that was uh, predictive of uh, poor outcome. Uh, I think that the uh, greater promise is held by uh, machine learning algorithms, but so far they have only been tested in very small cohorts. MRI, on the other hand, has been better tested and uh, uh, typically it is used later on in patients with indeterminate prognosis uh, uh, after the first few days, and that gives uh, a better chance to uh, the uh, brain image to uh, show uh, uh, findings that have predictive value. Uh, typically, we look at the DWI and we see the extent of uh, cortical uh, injury uh, uh, in, uh, as expressed by restricted diffusion that looks like this. Uh, but in addition to the cortical changes, we can see changes in uh, the basal ganglia, both in DWI and in flare. However, the most validated tool, and going back to my question, is the degree of uh, a, a, a reduction of uh, a, the uh, ADC uh, a, on uh, both uh, the cortex and the uh, basal ganglia, particularly in uh, the cortex, as uh, we will see. Most of the literature uses ADC as the reliable prognosticator. Yet in practice, we mostly use qualitative assessment. Uh, unfortunately, this has uh, limited inter-rate reliability with disagreement rates uh, reaching one in five uh, cases among even trained observers. An attempt at standardizing the way that we read MRIs uh, it has been uh, proposed like in this by this Korean group in 2015. But the reality is that uh, no scoring system is used consistently in practice. Uh, and uh, uh, I want to alert you that retrospective series have reported suspiciously high sensitivity for prediction of poor outcome. Uh, which uh, smells of the possibility of self-fulfilling prophecy. Whenever you get a retrospective study in which uh, the findings of a diagnostic test uh, were known to the clinicians delivering the prognosis, uh, you have to be uh, aware of the possibility that uh, the high predictive value of a test uh, was actually contaminated by the fact that that led to the prognostication and the prognostication in turn determined uh, the outcome of the patient. Now, quantitative uh, ADC, as I said, is the most validated tool uh, and uh, allows for total brain uh, assessment. Uh, uh, the two values that I keep in my mind uh, uh, are if uh, more than 10% of the voxels in the total brain 
have an ADC value greater than uh, 650, uh, it, that is a uh, bad prognosis, extensive uh, a restricted uh, diffusion. On the other hand, uh, if uh, there is very little uh, rain with a very low uh, ADC value that can uh, indicate good possibility of recovery. There are certain areas, certain locations where uh, a, um, the, uh, a, the, uh, the higher average ADC value can uh, predict good recovery compared with other locations. One of them is the post-central cortex. Again, there is a typo here. So the more voxels that you have with the low ADC, the worse uh, that the patient should read less than 650. And if you have very little uh, uh, parts of the brain with very low ADC, then the prognosis can actually be good. The problem is that these studies are uh, uh, based on uh, primarily small cohorts. The optimal specificity, uh, when you try to optimize the specificity of uh, the technique uh, and of the cutoff, uh, that is ach achieved only at the expense of very low sensitivity. In other words, uh, uh, you, in order to capture the patients with really bad prognosis with reliability, you end up uh, not recognizing poor prognosis uh, in a, a, a bunch of cases, which may not be bad, but it's something to uh, keep in mind. As a consequence, the areas under the curve uh, for the overall predictive value of uh, uh, these tests uh, are good, but they are not great, typically in the range of 0.7 uh, plus other studies, uh, apart from the ones that I uh, uh, cited in the previous slide, have reported different uh, thresholds. Uh, the uh, the 650 and 450 that I mentioned before are the most conservative and the ones that uh, probably are better to use. But different thresholds have been reported by different uh, uh, investigators. And finally. Uh, the, the timing of uh, brain MRI across centers and even within uh, studies uh, have been variable. And there has been uh, a, a group in Korea that has been defending the, the predictive value of ultra early DWI, even within the first uh, 24, 48 hours. Uh, and I think that that is dangerous, as uh, very eloquently uh, Dr. Jokadin has uh, uh, mentioned in his talk, uh, a, a very early prognostication should be uh, strongly discouraged. There are other imaging modalities, more sophisticated, fancier, sexier, that uh, have been proposed, but none of them are ready for prime time in regular practice. This includes rest, rest in state functional MRI, with a good outcome associated with greater preservation of functional cognitivity, connectivity. MR spectroscopy, where you see uh, worse outcomes with decreased uh, N acetyl aspartate and increased uh, lactate, particularly in the posterior singlet gyrus, uh, which is uh, one of the areas that you pay more attention to also when you do functional MRI. And finally, uh, uh, there has been some very limited investigation with FDG PET scans, uh, where poor outcome has been associated with reduced overall global uptake uh, in the brain. When, when you put all the studies of uh, brain MRI together, uh, back to this, uh, a, the importance of this false positive uh, rate uh, with confidence intervals, uh, you see that uh, none of the uh, uh, values uh, and parameters that can be uh, derived from a brain MRI have a, uh, a, a false positive uh, rate that is uh, perfect. And uh, the spread of the confidence intervals varies across the studies. So when and how to use imaging, and uh, this is me saying, not uh, the literature, ideally, uh, when the patient still has indeterminate prognosis, I prefer to do it uh, not earlier than five days after uh, the cardiac arrest. Some people have used it at uh, three, four days. I prefer to wait as much as possible for five days. Uh, and uh, uh, 
I always uh, think that extensive cortical injury, particularly if associated with injury to the basal ganglia, is bad, but it always should be put into context. Uh, you know, brain MRI is used for uh, functional prognostication uh, in other areas of uh, acute neurology. Uh, but the outcome uh, a measure that has been used in uh, cardiac arrest uh, studies has been uh, a recovery of consciousness or not. Uh, I think that there is uh, a, there has to be value for uh, brain MRI as a prognostic indicator of uh, cognitive recovery, but this has not been investigated thus far. And finally, and very importantly, a negative MRI, even a repeatedly negative MRI, does not mean that the patient will wake up. It is better to see a, a negative MRI compared with an MRI with extensive injury, sure, but it doesn't mean that the patient will eventually wake up. So I'll, I'll conclude uh, pretty much with uh, uh, with these. Uh, I uh, just putting things together like uh, Dr. Maciel did in, in her last slide. When you prognosticate in these patients, the prognosis has to be multi-parametric. Uh, you have to put the type of arrest, shockable versus not shockable, the previous patient condition. What is the protoplasm that the patient uh, brought in before the cardiac arrest? The systemic condition of the patient uh, is the patient in multi-organ failure has the patient has had uh, refractory uh, shock following the cardiac arrest. Then you put that with the serial physical examinations with something that is super important that needs to be mentioned before we conclude the hour, which is that uh, a, uh, the timing of prognostication and uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, even the findings on EEG are highly dependent on sedation. You can have a flat EEG with, uh, when the patient is uh, anesthetized. You can uh, have uh, a most of the uh, uh, bad findings on examination mimicked, mimicked by uh, 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 residual effects of uh, sedation. Never underestimate the effect of, uh, of sedation in these patients. We already discussed uh, EEG and SSCPs, uh, biomarkers, either NSE, or there is a recent meta-analysis that uh, uh, it conveys the message that uh, neurofilament, uh, 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 light neurofilament in serum can be a better prognosticator than neuronal specific enolase and always serial better than single measure. And then as we discussed, uh, a brain imaging. And you put all these parameters in addition to the patient uh, wishes uh, and preferences uh, as uh, you can gather from uh, the family and only then can you deliver an individualized prognosis that is pertinent to the case. So in conclusion, no prognostic parameter, including imaging, should be used in isolation. Frank global edema on CT and extensive cortical injury on uh, brain MRI, particularly with a very low ADC, uh, 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 are uh, poor prognostic uh, indicators quantitative uh, uh, are always better than qualitative measures and automated uh, uh, techniques are more precise uh, than not automated techniques. Machine learning uh, hopefully will help, uh, will, will uh, deliver more reliable and precise information in the future. And with that, I thank you very much. And hopefully there are a few uh, uh, minutes still for questions. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, lots of exciting, uh, really exciting talks. Um, and also great questions in the Q&A, um, many of which are calling for maybe another, uh, another session and more research, asking about what does good outcome even mean, uh, asking about uh, if we're uh, risking not waiting long enough, is there a risk of waiting too long? And also a few questions about what can we do to improve um, prognosis. Uh, I, I wanted to um, maybe just get to, to one question for uh, Dr. Marcial around uh, treating EEG just because of maybe this very recent New England Journal article that, um, that has sort of rocked the boat around this. 
Yeah, and it is a very well conducted study, very rigorous. They had a standardized protocol to try to reduce uh, variability in the chosen uh, the, uh, the choice of medications. But um, the target uh, chosen uh, is uh, what I have concerns about. So they did not use a strict definition for um, status epilepticus uh, and rather put um, every, you know, epileptic form discharge in an organized pattern, rhythmic and periodic pattern in the same box. They do do sub uh, group analysis, but still, right, it was not uh, the target population. So um, treating that page of EEG that the, EK, the, the, the brain is doing the same thing that the EKG is that patient likely to benefit from aggressive anti-seizure uh, treatment? Most definitely not, uh, right? V rather than um, a, a very um, kind of like eloquent brain that has preserved continuity and it has an increased uh, hyperexcitability with an organized status epilepticus pattern, this is more likely um, to, uh, to respond to um, aggressive treatment. And we have to also understand that those are post-cardiac arrest patients that have systemic intolerance uh, to uh, the side effects from uh, deep anesthesia, right? Um, and this is important to take into consideration too um, when going aggressive in this patient population. Can I make one quick comment, Claire? I, I agree with what uh, Carolina said, but I just like to emphasize to the listeners, and maybe you know this already, that the study did not have anything to do with prognostication. That's number one, because they may be, oh yeah, if you have this, you have a bad outcome and therefore we will withdraw care, that's number one. Number two, this study had nothing to do with us being able to treat seizures if we see seizures. That is a different intervention in itself because what the study was looking are the intermediate, not really seizures, right? So, so we have to differentiate that and do not overextend the interpretation into those entities. Uh, it, just, just to clarify, Romer, what, what you're trying to say, it's not that it had nothing to do with prognostication. It tried to have to do with prognostication, but what you are questioning is uh, the fact that uh, there was not uh, standardized uh, prognostication strategy to eliminate the possibility that uh, there could be self-fulfilling prophecy, et cetera, right? Right. And, and, and thank you for pointing out that out. Actually, in my slide, I, that's why I showed that, because the self-fulfilling, the, the withdrawal of life support in this study is 70%, 70%. Yeah. So, and, 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 and I just like to highlight this. This is very concerning to all of us who are doing clinical trials, because when you look at clinical trial design, what they really wanted to do was to discover if there was a 7% difference. If you have a seven, per, if you're looking for a 7% difference and your withdrawal of life support is 70%, that's not physiologic, you're not going to find a result. So that is the other thing that I, I was alluding to when I say that withdrawal of life support has serious implications not only to the patient, but also to the science, because we are no longer going to see the natural history of the interventions that we have. And I know that this will be a longer conversation because how long would that be? And that's why I actually shared that AHA statement because we tried to address that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, wonderful discussions, uh, great presentations and questions. I would firstly like to uh, thank our moderator and our speakers for being with us today. Uh, thank you everyone for, for joining and for raising your, your questions. As mentioned, a recorded version of this webinar will be available on our World Stroke Academy site. In the meanwhile, make sure to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn for our upcoming educational activities. Um, up next, our next webinar will take place on April 6th, 4 p.m. CET on the topic of big data, a game changer to advance stroke care in the digital era. We look forward to seeing you in our next webinar. And until then, take care, everyone. Thank you very much.